to the ADNA Presents. Today, we're very happy to have Saffron Henderson joining us. Uh, so honored to have Saffron because of her solid voiceover career. She is also doing audio description and animated series, and her credit list on IMDb is uh, two miles long. It's so exciting to have her a part of this, and thank you for joining us, Saffron. Oh, thank you, Roy. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here with you. Oh, it's likewise. That's so glad it's mutual. What do you love about audio description? I love so much about audio description. First of all, I get to sit in the womb, which is what I call the studio, <laughs> and watch on a big screen programming that I might not have time to see or follow the entire series of and describe it. And I just, it's so fun knowing that we've got this other dimension to the program so that I could sit, you know, with my buddy who's low sighted and we could both watch it and experience it together. And I'm so proud of the writers and especially at Descriptive Video Works where I do all of my audio description. They are, they're really in uh, community so we've got low sighted people on the staff who are not just doing focus groups, but really driving and guiding like what's useful, what's not useful. And I just feel like I'm part of a little engine that's doing something good. I love it. What a great answer. It's it's great to hear about that experience, the, the fun that you talk about. And I've never heard the word dimension used in this context before. Can you go in a little bit more detail about what that means to you? The, the dimension of audio description. It sounds so like sci-fi cool. I think that when it's done really well, it's unobtrusive. It is bringing information in a seamless way so that I'm hearing dialogue and music and action. And it's just, it's in the right spot so that I have everything I need to fully experience the program and, and what the creators were trying to create for all of us. So it's a dimension just like the audio track that's already there that's got dialogue and music and and people falling over and all the sounds that we hear and you know we've got subtitles we've got audio description we've got these dimensions that we can add to the programming so that all of us are having the full experience and like i say when it's done really well and the voice is a good fit for the show and the approach is a good fit for the show and the recordist is sitting there going, I know how we nudge this, or I'd like to hear a little more emotion or less emotion. And we have that collaboration. It is dimensional. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I am loving everything you're saying. It's just, <laughs> this is, but what I'm hearing you anchor your perspective on this is that that full experience in alignment with what the creators made you used the words unobtrusive, you said seamless, you said it hits the right spot. And the teamwork, the collaboration, you said, the, the, the collaboration with so many different people. You had said earlier about being part of the engine. You mentioned the writers, you mentioned the uh, the recordist, and it sounds like the directors. Uh, you've, you've mentioned how you've collaborated with them. What do you find your contribution is, professionally speaking, in the audio description track? Like, What makes you get hired all the time like why do they and I, i'm not questioning it i'm asking what is it about you that you bring to this work that keeps you being chosen i don't know i mean part of it is that i'm really interested in the work so my delivery is probably going to convey that i'm i'm wanting to be a part of this plot a little bit i certainly have learned a lot about it and i've learned that if i'm overacting or or reacting to what's going on around me, I actually take away from that dimension. So really, I guess one thing I can do is get through the credits really quickly. So maybe that's why I get hired. I love racing through credits. Sometimes <laughs> I stumble, but when we're doing several episodes of something and I sort of get to know them a little bit and I just, I love it. There you go. <laughs> so it just flows right out, right? It's super satisfying. <laughs> It's well, super satisfying. And also, I think maybe flexibility because I love putting my voice in different places. Sometimes it's going to be smooth and relaxed and other times it, we're going to have a, a younger, more action oriented kind of a voice. And I love being able to play with that. That playfulness has come up both as an audience member when you've experienced audio description as well as your performance. You've mentioned performance a few times. Can we talk maybe about some similarities 
to audio description performance compared to other work that you've done in audio description or maybe some differences? Like what are some similarities and differences between the different areas of voiceover that you work in? Well, audio description, I would say, is most like narration in other contexts, as with a documentary or something where, again, you're fitting yourself into that audio so that everybody's having the full experience. And when you're, you know, narrating, it's very close to describing. But it's pretty different than being a tiny anime character who's screaming and yelling and kicking and fighting and all that sort of stuff. It's like kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, but but yay, because we get to do both. <laughs> do you find that that narration style to be, I don't want this to be a setup question. Let me see if I can ask this clearly. That we, You talked about that tiny little character in the anime versus the narration in a documentary. One of the things I really want to hang on to is that that focus of making sure that your audience has the full experience that I personally feel like that audio description or narration, it's not less of a performance. It's a much more nuanced high wire act of a performance, whether you agree with that or not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is that you really do care, but it's not caring in the sense of overacting or underacting. There's like that. It, it sounds like the way you're speaking of this is that there's a fine line. It's a supportive role. Like I want it to have flavor. You know, if there's something that we can't possibly describe as dramatically as it's happening, it's like when you're on a freeway and you're going really fast and you just barely, barely move that steering wheel and you're in the other lane. It's the same thing where it's like, I want to adjust so that you're hearing exactly how urgent this is. But if I'm overacting, we've blown it for you and you're out of the story. So I've heard audio description. I've heard good audio description. I've heard what I would have to call poor quality audio description. I've heard AI audio description, which broke my heart. And the really good stuff, I was like, ooh, I like that person being on my shoulder and, and helping me know what's happening. And then I've heard stuff that sounds either really forced or like they didn't understand how everything was gonna interlock. So maybe it's a bit overdone or a bit pushed sounding when it didn't need to be that way. Like there was maybe a little problem there, but I've heard some great audio description and it's delicious. <laughs> I got to say the first time I've heard this analogy of the uh, driving on the freeway and that slight adjustment on the steering wheel that what a brilliant analogy. Thank you for sharing that. that oh, thank you. Uh, that's so cool. That's like, <laughs> yeah, we could, you can run with that. It's so good. And as you also said, it's like understanding the differences of what quality means as far as the performance goes, as far as the voice talent. We're not talking about the writing or the, the mix or even how people are turning it on. We're just talking about how you take that script and bring it to life in a way that supports with flavor, you said. I'm so <laughs> well, you said you used yeah. the word um, nuance, which I really appreciate. Yeah, it is nuanced. Let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, challenges that you've had in audio description. If you're comfortable sharing something as, as specific or as generalized as you'd like, a challenge that you'd really proud that you overcame. Well, one challenge is that when there's puppies on screen, I start to, or cute animals, when we're doing shows that I just, I lose the plot and I start making mistakes. I'm so distracted. <laughs> the other thing is when there are, um, are sexual scenes also totally distracted. And then we wind up keeping having to go back to it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't want to see it again. I just, I can't concentrate. <laughs> that happens every once in a while. It's pretty funny. So. <laughs> Another challenge is the first audio description job I did, I needed to be a 14 year old British girl for that was going to be the narration. And so it was a stretch right off the bat. Being an actor really helped, but it was a great challenge because it was a full series. So I needed to stay in that voice, come back, you know, several different days in that voice, getting through, I don't remember how many seasons, but that was a challenging experience and I loved it. <laughs> and I, I'm imagining that with that series, we did not add any puppies just to make it even more, that thankfully, There hopefully. were horses though. There were oh, those are cute. Horses. Oh, another challenge is uh -huh. that 
I start to cry right where right where the creators would want you to cry. Mm. Uh, there I am describing the audio uh, crying. So that's super embarrassing. But again, I'm in the womb. I've got my recordist. They're all so lovely and so supportive and I can be vulnerable with them. And if I say that really, really reached me and now I need to have an actual cry, they will just wait for me <laughs> to get through it. And I do want to bring tenderness to those moments, but my little emotions just go too far and spill over sometimes. And that is a challenge. And what I'm hearing is that your own emotional experience is important. And it's also something that what I'm hearing is you don't want it to get in the way of the audience's own emotional experience. That, exactly, uh, exactly. It's, it's a very respectful thing to say, I'm going to have my thing, but it's not going to go on mic. This is this is for me. Let me get this out. And then that way the audience can have that same thing on their terms. And and it, it's a very respectful way to to treat our audience. And I love I love how you shared that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. What about where you see audio description headed? Where do I see it headed? Well, first of all, um, I just want to report that we've had live audio description at the Olympics and other huge events, and I'm so proud that this work is being done. I don't know. I don't know if I could do it. I mean, that sounds that sounds really tricky. But anyway, there are experts doing this from DVW and other, you know, other studios. And I'm I love that. I want more of that. I want us to be able to show up and narrate just everything. I would love to see that across the board. I'm I'm concerned that there is some machinery that's happening that either involves AI or where the, the the quality of performance is just not even a thing. And the the idea of it being robotic in any way is really scary to me. And I really don't want that to continue. And I really want the audiences to have just super high quality, just doing the material justice, doing the audience justice, so I would like to see more caringly produced audio description and just all across different genres, across different platforms. I don't know. What do you think? What, where do you want it to go? Oh my gosh. You've covered a lot. I think that one of my favorite parts, and I'm hearing you, you say this, that it is a respectful treatment of the audience that the work that you've done historically in audio description as well as in other aspects of your performance that there's a care that you've brought to the work that you've done the work to be able to bring your best performance so that the audience can fully immerse themselves when i go back to earlier you would one of the things that you had said was to have that full experience and mm -hmm. to be able to say to our audience we're going to give you just the bare minimum and you should be pleased with that and that should be enough seems like such a discriminatory position to put our audiences in particularly when blind professionals are also involved in this work it seems very hurtful in whether it's intentional or not i don't think matters and i think that if i were to have my dream and a lot of the work that i've been focusing on this podcast is another example is that by interviewing professionals like yourself the way that you share what you do i think it helps up and coming blind or sighted performers respect this work in a way that needs to be respected. And it also helps our audiences understand the nuance of what goes into this work in a way that gives an appreciation that uh, it, it kind of peels back a little bit. Like, I feel like you've let us in on your process a little bit and thank you for sharing that that gives us a, a way to understand, oh, Saffron does this. And, you know, if I'm listening to something and I, I don't feel like I'm a part of it, there's something missing that I don't get when I listen to Saffron's performance, that that kind of conversation happening with our audiences, I think will help elevate this work to continue to go in the direction it's going. Mm -hmm. I'm, that? Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, I just think it's uh, it's fantastic work. I really do. Have you ever had any contacts outside of your studio? Any feedback? Oh, well... I don't know if you call this feedback or not, but one of the project managers emailed me once and said, we've got four projects going to Sundance Festival. 
And she said, and you're the narrator on three of them. And I was <laughs> so excited. I was so excited. And I didn't know that our narration goes to Sundance with the project. I had no idea. Did you know that, Roy? I had no idea. Uh, Everett Bacon, I think, was helpful in getting Sundance to have audio descriptions. So I'm going to make sure that he listens to this part. <laughs> but I was so excited. Hearing, but what I'm hearing is that out of those projects, you were chosen. And that is a form of feedback that you bring. Oh, I felt like I won an award. Yes. There's no award for me, but I was like, what? I'm going to Sundance. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> that funny but it was oh, one of wow. it was like a moment where I went oh this is so cool because the work was so great that they were sending and it had mm. us on it we were part of it so we're getting to be part of some pretty amazing projects yeah it kind of went outside the womb on that didn't you I kind of went outside the womb. Well, I mean, it's like my husband was a scout for the Red Sox and he got a ring. He was a baseball player for 14 years and oh. never got one. But mm -hmm. as a scout, he won a ring. <laughs> <laughs> so what a great career. <laughs> wow, yeah, yes. So it's kind of the same thing where, you know, you feel you feel very much honored to be a part of that, even though your work's maybe, maybe not the biggest part of it. <laughs> It's uh, it, it's an important part, and it's uh, it's so cool to hear that that that's the the kind of respect that you're given from your company. It's got to be. Oh, so then when they to, when she t told me that, I literally just was like, <laughs> my jaw dropped. I thought, what? Wow, the reach, the reach. It's so neat. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Do you think, you know, at at one point. In another context, you were talking about a little bit of a race to the bottom with audio description. And do you think it's because it's being mandated? Is that a response to it being mandated? And do you think that the producers like on a large scale are just like, ah, let's just get it done. We have to do it. We don't want to do it. It's legal. What do you think that's about? I do have a strong opinion. And it's okay, just well, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. When I look at the audio description projects, 7,200 plus titles that have audio description, and I see that one half of 1% of those are mandated, at least in the US, that tells me something. That tells me that there is something else there. There's an opportunity. I, I like to say there's probably negotiations behind the scenes that are happening that, that make that happen, maybe like an unofficial mandate, so to speak, like do this or else. I don't know, but what or I do it's know, a standard. it's a standard for great production. Maybe that's what it is. What I'm seeing is that this race to the bottom is not sustainable, that there's some really brilliant voice talents that have been unable to continue in this work, that there's been some blind professionals who have been taken advantage of in ways that don't seem fair as far as compensating for the value that they bring to this work. Mm -hmm. So in my dream world, I think there's a very specific kind of advocacy where when we do say, let's find ways that our audiences and our professionals are respected, that that will help change the race from how cheap can we make this work or how fast can we make it to how inclusive can we make it? How great we talk about quality and excellence since day one on this podcast. What is quality and excellence? And to chase that instead of hey, look, we just shaved another few dollars off and we just made this happen even faster than we used to. And, you know, we cut these extra rolls out of the performance that that doesn't seem like it's going in the direction that's going to be fair to, uh, to our audiences in the same way that sighted people are able to have the best entertainment experience with all the streaming services competing against each other. It's not, hey, look how cheap this production was, but look how immersive and powerful this experience was. And what a great series. I have to subscribe to blah, blah, blah streaming service because they're providing us the best experience. I see an analogy there that if audio description follows in that path, how great can we make this work? That there's going to be a different kind of race. And I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to see that these conversations are happening, that having you on here elevates this work by you being able to share what you do and the quality and excellence that you bring to it. 
you know, I, it's, uh, it's really exciting and it feels satisfying to know that, that that's the direction. So let me go back to the question about the mandate. I feel like the mandate is an essential part of this. I do not want to say we should not have a mandate. That is not my message. But what I am saying is the mandate is for quantity right now and that there's another focus that we can bring to this, which is quality. And that is kind of subjective and that's going to be hard to, to come across, but I, I think it's on its way. That's great. I like that. That's encouraging. It is. And there are streaming services that have really high standards that are doing quality control on our audio description. Thank you so much for doing that because if we come back into the studio to fix something, I'm thrilled. Mm. One of the cool things that is happening related to that is that blind professionals being involved in this work brings that quality up. There is a direct correlation there. Tremendously. I actually studied to be an audio description writer. Like they took me through a training then I failed. Well, I kind of, okay. It wasn't like that. It was like, we got to the end of the training period and they were like, um, we just would really need to babysit you a lot for a few months. And we don't have time. We've got a lot of projects. I'm so sorry. We're going to just keep you narrating, but thanks for trying. And I was like, <laughs> what? I wanted to write, <laughs> but, um, cause I wanted to do it all. I just, I would love to be involved on any level, but, uh, guess who tried to describe too much in their writing and <laughs> was maybe not always focused on keeping it sort of seamless and was more like what well, they have to know the color of that guy's hat. Cause it was, you know, like it was crazy what I was doing. It's not crazy. And I got better and better at it, but the work that goes into that writing, I spent 10 hours on a 10 minute piece or something. And uh, I can tell you, they work so hard, those writers to fine tune the language. And it's tricky. Like I, I read scripts where I'm like, Oh, probably this would make more sense than that. Because or or a writer will make a little mistake, because they were probably up till three in the morning writing it. And I, I can see that it's not, we're never going to do it perfectly as writers or narrators, I don't think, but, but I so respect the work that that writer does to put words out there artfully and yet simply. And one of the biggest things I learned was you've got to give people's brain a minute to catch up with what you just said. You can't hammer them with details without letting it ever land or else we don't keep up. So I learned a tremendous <laughs> amount about this process. And as a narrator, I really appreciate what they do. It's beautifully said. This is such a great conversation, Saffron. Thank you for this. Thank you so much. Could I ask you to share how people can follow you on social media or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm going to this at the end of April, I'm going to KameaCon, which is this big Dragon Ball uh, convention. And I don't do conventions. And I haven't done, I've, I've done maybe two way back when. And all these voices that I recorded in the 90s, like Son Goku and Son Gohan for Dragon Ball. Like, I was the OG, for those of you listening, I have gray hair, uh, the OG voice for the English dub of those. Wow. And I've always sort of just avoided any sort of convention type things. And then they asked me just a while ago and I was like, okay, I'm going to go. And then they said, well, you got to promote us on social media. And I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> on social media. So I started a uh, TikTok account and an Instagram account. Very and the cool. Instagram is at saffron.voice. That's on Instagram and on TikTok. It is at Saffron Voice, just like that. Very cool. Thank you for that. Very excited to be following along. And it's going to be neat to see how that uh, experience happens for your, your, uh, your convention. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear the excitement in your voice. Uh, it'll be fun. Yeah.
Oh, this is wonderful. I'm so glad how much we were able to cover here. And thank you for sharing your time and your expertise and your talent and for all the work that you do in audio description and beyond. So thank you very much, Safra. Thank you. I will be listening for you. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs>